I think it was Tolstoy, the the writer, who said uh, music is the shorthand of emotion, which I, I always liked that. That's great, I don't know that man. that's inspirational, but I, I love that. <laughs> He's not the guy who also said that like religion was the opiate of the people or something. No, that was somebody else. <laughs> Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hey, everybody, it's Lid Shaw. I'm your host of Recording Studio Rockstars, the podcast bringing you inside the recording studio. I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your recordings to the next level and become a rock star of the recording studio yourself. My guest on today's show is a friend and studio team member, Joe Hutchinson. Joe is a professional mastering engineer right here in Nashville, Tennessee, but he masters records for artists from all over the world. Whether Canadian blues, Austrian folk music, or American Christian music, Joe often helps indie artists finish their records with a major label sound. Joe is also part of my team at the Bonnaroo Hay Bale Studio and the Pilgrimage Sessions, two huge festivals where we record, mix, and master up to 40 bands and 100 songs in a single weekend, recording amazing artists like the Avid Brothers, Ben Folds, and Cage the Elephant, Joe will deliver finished masters ready for upload and airplay on the radio as fast as an hour after the performance. I love hanging out with this guy, and I'm thrilled to have Joe Hutchinson with us today on Recording Studio Rockstars. Joe, are you ready to rock, sir? Yes, sir. Well, so, hey, I introduced you to our listeners. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself in your own words and, and uh, who you are and how you got into this whole mess? Sure. Um, well, I sort of uh, stumbled into mastering years ago. I moved to Nashville to go to Belmont University some time ago and originally was actually planning on studying music, but switched to audio engineering and became really fascinated with it. And And as time went on, sort of came to realize that mastering was one of the more interesting parts of the process to me. And just from a strictly business standpoint, there were a lot less people doing it. So I thought maybe I should look into this. Everyone wants to produce and mix records, you know, someone's got to master them. But then I, I actually really like it. It really works for me. It's very meticulous or can be at times. And I, I like that a lot. I'm not a big name mastering guy and it might be the main thing that I do. And it's probably my favorite thing to do, but it's not all that I do. I, I still do you know, little, little odd jobs, other engineering, you know, I'll, I'll mix stuff sometimes. I'll track drums for somebody, you know, lot, lots of other little things. It's not like, you know, I'm not Bob Ludwig over here or anything. It's like, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, you were actually talking about a super cool thing that you're up to recently. You were, you said you're doing some live, it's sort of like live sound, but it's still studio based. Somehow over the past couple of years, I've become the guy who runs tracks at Christian award shows in Nashville, which is kind of funny. So, you know, bands who use performance tracks as part of their performance, especially bands that, that, you know, rely on that a bit. They, they want to make sure that nothing goes wrong during this award show. Cause some, you know, sometimes it's aired live over the radio or whatever. So, you know, I have this redundant rig where I've got two computers going at the same time that are synced up. And if one of them goes down, radio makes this box called an SW8, which takes two inputs and one output. And it also takes like a sine wave from one of the computers. And if the sine wave disappears, AKA the first computer stops playing, it just automatically switches. It's instantaneous. You can't even hear it. It's really wow. cool. So if like one of your computers just catches fire somehow, then no one knows. It just switches to the B computer. It's That's cool. awesome, man. I think that description you just gave... Probably like uh, if we're lucky to um, you know have hundreds of people listening to this, then hundreds of people will be totally confused by the yeah, sound. Yeah, I'm wave. sorry. But then when you, <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. But then as soon as you got to the part about when your computer quits, the other one takes over right away. Hundreds of people will totally get that. You know, so <laughs> that's a good that's a good thing anyway, to know about. But yeah, that's just a little a little fun side job that I do once a year over the so, past couple and years. And clearly, you know, that's pretty uh, it's pretty involved. It sounds like some. Fairly technical stuff. You know, I know we're dealing with computers and once they're working, they do a lot of things that you don't have to think about, but just to get something like that going, I imagine that's, that's got to take a minute to figure out, you know? Yeah, it, it does. It definitely does. 
Is that something that's been a skill set of yours? Have you always been pretty computer savvy or like, you know, did you, uh, did you start out like, why'd you get into this stuff? What made you even want to do music in the first place? I, I was into music and was a musician long before I was interested in audio at all. I think, you know, playing in bands in high school and actually reaching the point where we went and had something professionally recorded in a real studio. And it was just such an intriguing experience for me. And I was so impressed by, by how this guy who we were working with could, you know, had all these ideas and all these techniques to make things sound so good versus, you know, like, I don't know, we were using some dumb things to try to record our own demos and it wasn't working. And so when we saw it actually happen, I think that was when I first started being like, man, maybe I, maybe I want to be a part of that. This is pretty cool. You know, making things sound good. Yeah. That totally happened to me too. I mean like that, um, the first time I saw a recording studio and of all places, it was in Hong Kong when I was playing in a blues band with my brother, Wow, <laughs> which I talked a bit about in, in the uh, episode zero of this. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was done in, I was like, it's all downhill from there. You know, I was like, forget about it. I had to do the studio thing after I saw a real studio. I remember that, like describe that experience a little bit more. So you saw the guy, he was doing his magic and that was cool to you. Um, I remember seeing lots of buttons and knobs and lights and I was like, thought I was inside a spaceship and I was like, man, this is me. But hold on. So let me say this too. When I saw a studio, it was probably 1990, 91, something like that. And it was still have been tape machines that wouldn't have had, they might've had a digital tape machine possibly that I didn't know about, but it certainly wasn't computers and pro tools. Um, how would you describe the studio when you were in there? Maybe it was a little bit later than that. Yes. Uh, it was early to mid 2000s, I guess. And it, it was Pro Tools. It was early Pro Tools, but it was there. And so, you know, he was doing a lot of stuff. He had a lot of analog gear recording, but then he was also doing a lot of stuff in the box. I remember seeing him playing around with throwing some samples in and that kind of stuff and like tuning the vocals. And I was like, whoa, you can do those things? <laughs> you know, <laughs> just starting to un- get into that world as well. Or so it was an early Pro Tools with like Pro Tools 4 or something I, like I that? I don't remember what five. version he was using because I didn't know anything at the time. Could have been, yeah. could have been five or something. But. Well, that's cool, man. Well, so, all right, well, let's jump forward into some of these, you know, kind of fun questions. Um, thank you for sharing some of your background and letting us know about uh, all that. Also, I want to get into a little bit more talking about um, the, doing the festival stuff a little later on. Let's sure. talk about that. Yeah. Um, but tell us, um, you know, can you share with us, I like to ask people for an inspirational quote, something that kind of can be a real motivator um, and just uh, words to live by when you're recording music. I think it was Tolstoy, the the writer, who said, uh, music is the shorthand of emotion, which I, I always liked that. That's great, I don't know that man. that's inspirational, but I, I love that. <laughs> He's not the guy who also said that like religion was the opiate of the people or something. No, that was somebody else. <laughs> Sorry. Um, back to serious. Um, that's a great quote. I love that. And the fact that you just brought in Tolstoy, uh, you know, AKA um, War and Peace, right? Yeah. I think that was Tolstoy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was. That's good stuff, man. Well, that's cool. Yeah. That's the soul of the people. And I totally agree. I've always felt like, you know, cause I've really thought about what is music? Like, what are we doing? Cause I've started out playing music with other people in bands. Muca- music has become mucus. I almost said mucus. Music has become, uh, you know, incorporating computers. Now all of a sudden you're like, am I playing with people or am I playing with computers? And I finally just came to this conclusion that music is really about people communicating with people. And if you use a computer in the middle, totally cool. But it's about, you know, communicating that emotion with people. I think, you know, I mean, somebody's going to come along after I say that and show me computer generated music that has no people in it and why it's so fantastic and I'll change my mind, but that's all right. For now, they're, they're, that's where I'm at on it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. All right. Cool, man. Dig it. Well, so um, let's see. Tell us about, uh, you know, something that was like a real important failure for you when you were getting started maybe, or just going through the process of getting to where you are now. Okay, so lately my focus has been on on mastering, and that's been kind of the thing I'm doing. So I'll just give an example of so one of the first things I ever mastered. I haven't listened to it in a long time, and I probably did a terrible job. But it was for someone who works on some pretty big records in town, and it wasn't a big record. It was it was you know a little side project he was doing. But I mean, he's he's I'm not going to say who he is, but he's he's, <laughs> he's worked on a lot of he's worked on a lot of cool records, and I had mastered some songs for friends but just kind of, 
I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I like, I just kind of had the general idea of how it worked, but I wasn't very good. And he sent me something and I maybe should have said no, but I was overly ambitious. I was like, yeah, totally. And it was something crazy. Like he sent it to me at 8 p.m. and said, I need this back by 4 a.m. or something. <laughs> so, right. I, so I stayed. <laughs> Nothing like friends to so, come through for you like that. So right? I stayed up all night and probably did a terrible job and sent it to him. And because yeah, it was this last minute thing. And, and I mean, I, you know, it worked, but it, was, it wasn't necessarily great. And, you know, I, I got paid and he said thanks. And then, you know, kind of he knew that I, I was young getting into it and he kind of gave me some feedback like, Hey, maybe next time don't do these things. <laughs> you know, or like, So you didn't feel you like know. it. So it didn't turn out well. I, I mean, I, I wasn't happy with it or proud of it. I, I, but mainly because I didn't know what I was doing and, and he has never called me for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have to worry about him anymore. Yeah. Well, so um, what was sort of a learning lesson from you after that? I mean, I, well, that was a long time ago. I just kind of realized that I hadn't done a great job. And actually after that experience went and did a lot of research. So I never took any sort of mastering classes while I was in school or had any sort of formal training. I talked to a couple mastering engineers and got some tips from them, mainly on like, don't do these things, right. you know, these things things are okay. Don't do these things. Don't mess up. Yeah. And then just did a lot of research, read a lot of articles on mastering, part of a book on mastering, and just kind of like studied what the good mastering engineers do and tried to just gleam as much as I could from that. And from there, I just kept working on a bunch of low budget, small projects and sort of figured out what I was doing over the years. <laughs> that's cool. At least more so than I did. Well, that's cool, man. So then how about a, uh, something that was, you know, a little later on that felt like a real moment of success for you? Something that was pretty awesome. Probably the first time. And other, I, other than working with me at Bonnaroo. <laughs> well, honestly, Bonnaroo is one of the coolest things that I've ever done. It, it honestly is. It's very cool. Yeah, I agree. I love doing that. Outside of that, maybe like a kind of an aha moment for me, I guess, was it may have been mastering. It also may have been when I was mixing or even recording something because mastering has only been my focus for a couple years. Just a moment where you're, you're working on something and you feel like you've at least somewhat adequately captured the emotion of the performance or of the song and you haven't done anything particularly amazing but you haven't gotten the way like you've really captured that emotion that feeling you know you've got this beautiful song and you want to portray that beauty and have people connect with it it was years ago the first time i worked on something and, and was just like listening to it and just kind of had this like oh yeah <laughs> this is actually this is really working you know probably not even necessarily so much to my own credit but reaching a point where i'm like oh i'm not getting in the way like i'm just trying to further this along and help people hear it and not be distracted by how silly it sounds well so Ian Shepard is another mastering engineer that has been on the show here. And uh, he talked about wanting something similar. It's like having somebody have a jaw dropping experience when they listen to music, you know, and it is cool when you have that, when things really work out right. Um, it's pretty awesome to feel that way. You know, what didn't know, have you experienced that those jaw dropping moments or things that you felt like you could predict or did they surprise you when it happened? I don't know. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they were things that I predicted, but I wasn't super taken by surprise, maybe like a pleasant surprise, not, you know, just kind of like, oh man, yeah, this actually, like this came together a lot more than, you know, I thought it did. And, and, you know, sometimes you can get a little too, you can get a little too deep into something and you just got to take a step back and take an hour off or even take the rest of the day night off and you listen back the next day and you say, and you know, oh, I need to fix this. Or you say like, oh, cool. No, this is really great. I should leave this alone. That's awesome, man. <laughs> it's, you know, have you, um, taking breaks is important. What about when tracks come to you? I, mean, I think I feel like jumping into some mastering oh, questions sure. for yeah, you. But yeah. so like when, it, when a mix comes to you, have you ever found a mix arrives and it's not exciting, but then when you're done with it mastering, now you are excited about it or vice versa. A mix is really exciting, but you somehow struggled with just getting it where you wanted it to go in the, in the finishing stage. Is there any, like, talk about the correlation between that. Is it, is a great mix the one that's easiest to master? Um, or, or is it, can you, you know, bring magic and life to something that's maybe not all the way there? I mean, I think a, a great mix is easiest to master, but along with that, 
when you're someone like myself, who's not a big deal mastering engineer, I have to fight the urge sometimes to do things that I, I feel like will make a significant difference because, you know, people are paying you and you want to send them back something that is somehow more exciting and better. But if the mix is already nailing it and you don't have to do much, I think it's your job to not do much. And one one of my favorite mastering engineers is Bob Ludwig, who's mm-hmm. maybe the greatest out there. I read an interview with him some time ago talking about how he's at the point where if someone sends him a mix and it sounds great and it's loud enough, he will do literally nothing. He will just sign off on it, <laughs> which I don't think I could ever get away with. But if if you're Bob Ludwig, you can get away with that. You know. Well, you know, at that point, I, I imagine what the idea is also that, you know, he is like uh, a gatekeeper. So you're almost saying, Hey, Bob, um, is it cool if I pay you uh, so that you could just check this out? And if it's good enough, can you tell me me if this is okay? And that's legitimate too. And that's sort of, I think that's, you know, one of the most important parts is, is just being that last set of years to catch things. I almost always find something wrong. And I don't mean that in like a, oh, this guy screwed up the mix way. I mean, there's, I just almost always hear like, hey, there's like a pop here. Is there like a bad edit somewhere? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I didn't hear that. You know, like those kind, those sorts of things are part of it. You're just the last set of years who listens, and and you know, I'll very regularly give some feedback to the mix engineer and say, like, hey, you know, the vocal feels kind of thin to me. Maybe give it a little more body. If I try to do too much of that, I I can end up muddying up the track, which is not what I want to do. And sometimes people send you a bunch of different versions and some stems, but I, you know, that's that, that's getting pretty deep into it. I try to avoid that. But. All right, so so let's back up for a sec. Let's let's get into some of the basics here. Oh sure. I'm gonna hit you with a really tough question. What is mastering? So I'm going to kind of repeat myself a little bit. I think mastering is the final step in the recording process. It's where... Well, I thought listening to the record was. Oh, sure. (laughs) Well, you're listening to the record while you're mastering. That's true. You're done (laughs) recording when you're listening to the record. But you want to make sure that the album sort of feels glued together. All the songs flow, you you know, nicely in sequence. The songs sound good together. Um, and then you also, probably the biggest thing that people think about when they think about mastering is is the loudness and the level and the overall sound. It's You do want it to sound, without trying to get too much into the loudness war, you do want it to sound comparable to commercial things that are out there so that, you know, someone makes a playlist and they play pop song A and then your song comes on next and it's half as loud. Like, you don't want that. That's, I would say, the thing that a lot of people look for in mastering is just getting it to that to that level where it can hang with commercial it's releases like that are out there. Like it's loud enough. Yeah, loud enough. But there are different ways to to get things loud. You don't just want to pull the threshold down on a limiter and squash the thing. Then it'll be loud, but it'll sound terrible. So, you <laughs> Well, so tell us a little bit about that. I mean, if we're going to talk about loud for a second, there are different ways. What are, can you, uh, I don't know if there are three, a list of three you could just throw out there, but what are, you know, three ways to get something louder? Uh, so um, when, when I say something, of course, I mean a, a finished mix of a right. song. So there are some tricks you can use to change the perceived loudness of something because the human ear hears different frequencies differently. So what do you do? Just like make the lights brighter in the room or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that there's, there's that kind of stuff. And then there, there obviously is raising the volume, which you do through compression and, you know, hard limiting and, and. Well, hold on, I'm going to back you up. So when you say perceived loudness, what does that mean to somebody who's new to hearing these terms? So. So if you're using some sort of loudness meter that's monitoring how loud something is, there are things that you can do without changing what it looks like on a meter. Let's say you're not listening to it. You can change through EQ, through some parallel distortion or some weird stuff. You can change the way it sounds and not necessarily change the way it looks on a meter, if that makes sense. So the meters don't change, but even though you're totally changing the sound. Yeah, or at least subtly changing the sound, which can affect how we perceive how loud it is. Okay. Which brightness has a lot to do with perceived loudness, high end. Uh, um, interesting. You, you so do, it sounds louder to the ear, even though it doesn't look louder to, you know, the electrons. Right. There's only so much to that. You can't just totally do that. That's just kind of like a, a trick, I guess. We love tricks, man. We yeah. love tricks. <laughs> Give us more tricks. There is definitely a lot of compression that goes on, kind of suppressing the the transients, the peaks, the loud points of the song, your big kick drums and your snares, kind of pulling those down so that the average level can come up. That's that's kind of the idea. And and the best way to do that without making it sound terrible is to compress the track a little bit 
a bunch of times. So rather than squashing it and hitting the loud parts, you know, where you're compressing it seven decibels or something, I'll use three compressors that are only doing two decibels and, you know, a limiter that's doing a decibel or something. That's, nice. you know, and kind of vary the attack and release time so that it doesn't sound like the same thing happening. I mean, that's that's just a trick. That's something. Okay, cool. So it's the does, idea of just using a little bit of many things to make the sum of all these parts sound better in the end. Sure. Okay, Trying cool. Anyway. Man. All right, well, let's let's jump back into some of our forward motion questions here. Um, tell us about something that you're just really excited about right now. I lately have been getting a lot more projects, like mastering projects than I have in the past, which is really cool because, I, I mean, that, that's really what I'm focusing on these days. So I'm excited about doing more of that and just getting better and continuing to do that and, you know, trying to reach a place where I don't have to do these other side jobs and that can just totally do that, which, you know, it, it makes up a good bit of what I do, but it's not 100% of all day. I'm not mastering a record every day, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I, I'm, I'm excited about sort of the momentum is sort of ramping up on that and I'm, I'm getting more projects and, you know, pe some people have just found I don't know them or I don't know, it's not a mix engineer. I know sending me something, people just, hey, I found your website and you know, I like what you did on there and can you master this record? And it's someone from a different country. I mean, like that, yeah. that, that stuff is pretty cool. And I'm, I'm excited about that and, and hope it keeps coming, but. Yeah, that's great stuff, man. Uh, you talked about doing stuff with Canadian blues and yeah, Austrian just, folk music. Just did and, a blues record from, for a guy in Canada about uh, two weeks ago. Well, so that's something that is pretty unique about mastering as an opportunity for somebody who's interested in recording. Um, I think mixing can be the same way, but mastering is really unique in that because the files that you're dealing with in mastering are relatively tiny. I mean, I know you still probably get some big files in the end, uh, various ways, but ultimately you're usually dealing with just finished, you know, stereo file and you're, you're manipulating that. So it's much easier. I imagine as a mastering engineer to have sort of an online presence. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? The, the opportunity to work with people in faraway places where, you know, if you were going to record a band, you'd have to be probably physically in the same place. True. Yeah. You, you are working with, with files that are not as large, so it makes it a little easier to send that stuff back and forth. You know, I, I just use programs like Dropbox a lot and, you know, have a shared folder with whoever I'm working with and, and they'll send me a round of mixes and then I'll listen through and say, hey, yeah, you know, it sounds great. Maybe make this tweak on this one song and then they can update it. And then I have it and I send them a round of masters back and and they ask me, hey, you know, can you put more space in these songs? It, it's easy to go back and forth. And it's like, it's not difficult at all to be in a different country. And I think it's pretty cool. You know, like, I don't know them. I probably will never meet those people. And I don't know anything about their music. It's Austrian and it's folky. Well, yeah, I, I did, I did <laughs> an cool. Austrian record at some point. Well, so, so hold on. Funny. I'm going to point something out to our listeners. Um, you just said something that m I think distinguishes a, a mastering engineer as you know the difference between maybe one that is you know kind of phoned in and one that is an amazing opportunity so you talked about interacting with the mix engineer and actually giving some mix feedback you know a little bit about that where it's like you know you're actually giving them a little bit of feedback on the mix before they send you a final mix to be mastered is that am i hearing you right on that yeah i mean that that's pretty common i think i don't know i don't know. Know. i don't, maybe, I don't always get that you know maybe but i mean it's not I think that's I don't, I don't always do it. a fantastic opportunity because I think that that is something that gives, you know, somebody who's making a record, somebody who's mixing, it gives them a chance to kind of get it right. I think for a lot of people who aren't mastering, I think for myself, you know, there's, there's, uh, I feel maybe a little less so now, but I certainly know I used to feel this way where is there's a big like mystery cloud of mystery around what's going to happen when it hits mastering and, you know, things come back and they sound different uh in a good way but sometimes you're like oh my gosh you know this now this thing doesn't i didn't mean for this to be so loud or to be so quiet or whatever and so um you know so the mixer might have this feeling of i don't know where to put the vocal or the kick or the bass or something so that it's right when it comes back through the mastering chain um so it's cool man that you give people that opportunity to interact with you like that well i mean i, th I think that's 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 just part of it. I mean, I, I think that's your job as a mastering engineer is to try to <clears throat> make sure that it's ready for the people to hear and that it sounds professional and polished. And, you know, some of that you can do as a mastering engineer, but some of that, if, if you really feel like, I mean, this obviously, you know, 
doesn't matter if people don't trust you or your opinion, but if, if you feel like something could improve by a mix tweak, it's usually nothing major, then um, I think it's important to let the mix engineer know. And, there, you know, there, I've never really run into someone saying like, no, you're wrong. Like, I think that's a terrible idea. It's usually like, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe so, you know, because someone who's mixing a song, they've probably, you know, maybe they've listened to it a hundred times. And I just, I listen to it as a totally detached person the first time through and my first impression based on, you know, all the music that I've listened to over the course of my life and recently. That's just all, I just listen to music all the time. <laughs> so there's a certain amount of like how, uh, a certain amount of how things should sound sort of ingrained in you, I guess. And then, you know, obviously I'll, I'll reference good sounding uh, commercial tracks when when I'm mastering to try to, you know, as, as some something to achieve, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Well, so um, I love that you talk about first impressions because I think first impressions are gold in the studio because really when you listen to music, you're just kind of having a first impression. You know, you're not sitting there listening to the same song over and over and over and over again all day, unless you're recording it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very not true. always that, but that's certainly very common. Well, that's cool. So what about the, um, you know, for somebody who is out there mastering and wanting to interact with some, with the mixer and, and dealing with it like that, um, what is, is there sort of a, when do you know if it's the right time to make a comment and suggest something? Is there a proper etiquette for doing that the right way? I mean, I just usually make a comment whenever I notice something. So typically when, when someone sends me something to work on, I, I start by just listening. I, I pull all of the songs into a session and just listen through all of them in sequence and kind of see what it, what my first impression is and, and kind of, you know, sometimes I'll take notes or, or just mental notes and, you know, like, okay, I need to be thinking about this. But I, I try to just start by listening through. Sometimes I'll work while I'm listening, but I like to just listen to, to start with. And if I notice something there, all the songs sound great, but this one song, the vocals just getting lost. You know, I'll try to just immediately say like, hey, you know, I, I just listened through these. I'm about to start working on them. I, I think that this song could benefit from a little more lead vocal. You want to, whenever you get the chance, make that tweak. And I'll go ahead and start working on the rest of them and just pull that in. I mean, there's that kind of thing. And then sometimes I've already sent them a round of masters and they ask me for another tweak. You know, like, hey, can you make this one song a little louder? And then I'll notice in a different song, you know, there's there's some kind of weird noise that somehow slipped through the whole time. And I, I've just noticed it. Oh man, there's this weird noise. Can you check out this time in this song? I say, like, oh yeah, that was like the guitar doing some weird thing. I'll, I'll cut that out and send it back. So it's just whenever you notice it, you know, you, you want to get stuff taken care of, but sometimes you miss things even on the first listen through. Well, that's cool. I like that, you know, getting that first impression, hearing the tracks back to back. Um, I know that Ian also talked about that, about a first move when you're mastering being leveling the tracks and balancing the levels between them mm -hmm. and, and then going from there because without that leveling, it screws with your perception of EQ and things like that, yep, right? Yep, it That's does. Cool. Very much. That's cool. So before we get into the next couple of topics, I want to make sure we get a chance to talk about the festival circuit with you, dude, and then also uh, get into the final round of questions, the jam session. Joe has actually generously um, created a super awesome offer for listeners of Recording Studio Rockstars. Joe is offering to do um, what he would call a test master Joe, can you describe a little bit more about what a test master is? Yeah, so basically, if you send a mix over to me, I will master the song, send them back, and, and it, it just kind of serves as an example of what I can do. So you, so you can sort of listen to a before and after of your mix as the way it was and, and your mix after, after it was mastered. And it's something that I'll do for free so that you can get an idea of what's going to happen before you commit to paying me for doing the entire album. And then based on if you like it or not, then, then we can move forward. If, if you don't like it, that that's fine. You know, oh, that's you, awesome. So now wait, do I get to just release this, this test master? You know, I, I, so prefer, the way it works, I prefer it? that you didn't, I, I honestly haven't ever had a problem with that. Um, right, right. so I suppose, I suppose I'll, I'll start getting a little more tight with it if I ever have a problem with it, but you start showing up at people's houses but and, typically, and listen, listen through the window and see if they're <laughs> typically I'm not like just sending an MP3 back or like half of a song. I usually just do it and send them the whole song back and 
and just have faith in people, which maybe is a mistake, but so far it's worked out for me. Awesome. Anyway, so that's a super generous offer, Joe. Thank you so much for doing that for our listeners. And uh, just a reminder to everybody that it's a test master, so it's not one that you can actually release. But if you are uh, looking for somebody to master your record and you decide to master your record with Joe, then of course it becomes one of the songs that you can use. So um, Joe... I want to talk to you a little bit about this whole festival circuit we've been doing together. It's such an awesome um, honor to work with you. And it's been such a pleasure doing Bonnaroo for for the past couple of years. And then also this year, we just started a whole new festival, the Pilgrimage Sessions, which is the Pilgrimage Festival out in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what that is all about? I mean, what what do you do there? What do do we do? What do you do? What is it? Man, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. So we're we're in this little studio that's like a single wide trailer that's been kind of reformatted into a tracking room and a control room and it's surra- this is Bonnaroo at least and it's surrounded by these hay bales that sort of give you some isolation from the sound outside you know Skrillex playing on the main stage and subs so are blowing let me, up the wait, place. So let me jump in. I'll, I'll also spell out Bonnaroo for anybody who's not familiar with it. Bonnaroo is a festival that's. 45 minutes south or about an hour south of Nashville, Tennessee, happens every year in June. It's on a giant farm field and there are, what is it, like one, two, three, four, five, five two huge stages and then, then three or four different tents um, and then a whole series of smaller stages and tons of events, 85,000 people for four days just Lots partying. I don't remember how many bands do, are, are actually at the festival. Just Hundreds, so right? many bands. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just in our studio alone, we have up to can have up to forty bands come through in four days. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. So so bands who are performing at the festival um, will come into the studio, which is kind of back behind one of the stages, and they'll do a live in studio performance of, of usually three songs. Um, and it's not a you know there are no overdubs, no anything. It's just the bands plugging in, playing live. Yeah. Um, sometimes they don't even use headphones. They just kind of, they just kind of do it in the room. So we're, and we're just capturing that, uh, Lidge is, is actually mixing it live on a console, which is just amazing. The mixes that he gets out of a live console. I mean, I would, I would blow it so hard if I was doing (laughs) that, but he does a a killer job and and they sound great. And then I'm, you're actually the one capturing the mix. I mean, I'm like, actually, I'm I'm just pushing a bunch of faders around. I'm not even recording it. (laughs) You're the one who records it on the other side of the yeah, studio. Well, you're, you're making it sound good. I just record a, a stereo mix of, of out of the console of what Lidge is doing. And uh, after the band's done playing their three songs, I'll chop that stereo recording. I'll chop it up into three radio-ready songs, and then I will master it as, as quickly as I can. Usually I'm I'm mastering it while that band is, is leaving and the next band is coming in because we've got a band every hour. It's really fast. And yeah. then... As soon, and when I'm done mastering it, I upload it to a radio server and it's played on the radio, you know, an hour later or something. I mean, it's, it's really, it's not just the radio. It's like 40 different radio markets all around the country. And I don't remember if there are some, any international stations too. I think they I don't might know. go up to Canada. And it ended up, it was, I ended up online somewhere too. I think, I don't know where, but, um, yeah, a bunch of radio stations online. It's, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty high pressure. Cause you you know, if you, you just I'm have so to, tough on you. <laughs> you just have to work. So well, you just have to work so fast. You can't really, you know, that, that's not a typical mastering scenario. You don't have the time to keep working on it until you feel like it's perfect. Okay. And okay. So are you using mastering speakers? What's your mastering studio look like inside a hay bale? Uh, I'm most, I'm mostly working on headphones and I do have a set of, of small monitors that I'll bring with me just to reference how it translates to monitors and, you know, the, the stereo field and, and that kind of thing. So I'll check them on, on speakers, but like while the band is performing, because it's so small and, and there, there is some bleed between the rooms, we're actually all listening on headphones. Um, and, and do you I, have to do any, make any decisions while the band's performing or does that happen after you're done recording? I'll, uh, I'll take notes. Um, if, if need be, if, if something seems like it's jumping out because there is a little bit, um, and again, this is a very abnormal mastering situation, but there's a little bit that you can do in, in the mastering situation. Maybe if someone, <clears throat> you know, you've, you've got what, what's called a, a P pop on the vocals or like a, a pop, like a, a low end. Here, show them what that sounds like. Like a p- <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of thing. But, but it's the real, it's the really, there's a pop filter on this microphone, so you won't even get the full effect. It's this really low end sort of, you know, triggers a sub kind of P sound and you know when sounds like a kick drum right yeah sort of and so when you've got the uh when you've got the punch brothers in or something they're just standing in a room around 
two mics or something playing, just leaning in and out, and it all sounds perfect. And you you know, Lidge doesn't want to do any crazy EQ to it, but then Chris Thiele leans in and, and says some big puh, and you know, all of a sudden you've got this big boom. So that kind of st- I'll actually have to automate like a, a high pass filter and, and cut that out if I notice something like that while we're while we're tracking. Um, but for the most part, it's just turning it into three songs and getting it radio ready as far as loudness and general sound. And just really quickly, I just have to trust my instincts. First impressions. And and just do, I mean, I probably get to listen through each song one time and I work while I'm listening to it and then it's done and I don't get to change anything. That's cool, man. That's so, so there's awesome. probably some really killer. bad stuff out there on the radio. No, no, that sounds so good, man. Your, your work sounds fantastic. You are a rock star of the studio for sure. Um, well, so, and then we just went down to the pilgrimage festival, which is a little bit similar to Bonnaroo, but it's also different because rather than being inside a hay bale studio out on a farm field in the middle of nowhere, we've teamed up with Dark Horse Institute, which is a a recording school in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, inside the factory, which is a sort of big, beautiful compound of a refurbished factory building. And so they have studios there that are right next, they're, you know, literally across the street from the festival. So this time around, we were able to record a lot of similar bands that we might've recorded at Bonnaroo, but they came into our studio at the pilgrimage and uh, we did what we were calling the the pilgrimage sessions. So we were inside um, a control room or rather I was mixing on an actual SSL, like full 48 fader SSL console this time. I think it was a G and an E series, depending on which, which modules you use and uh, on a pair of speakers. So I didn't have to use headphones this time. And the, and the band was out in a full studio isolated control rooms and then you were not in the same room with me. Can you tell a little bit about what it was like mastering in that situation? Well, yeah, I was in kind of a B control room where I also had glass and, and could see into the band while they were performing. Um, but once again, I'm I'm just recording Lidge's live mix. And uh, also there were typically some people kind of hanging out in my room watching the performance because it was a little less crazy in, in my room. So I usually had some people hanging out and just listening and and recording while the band's performing. And then I tried to sort of treat it the same way as Bonnaroo in that, you know, when when the band's done, I just try to get the first bit of mastering done. Um, I had a little bit more time than Bonnaroo because there wasn't a radio station hounding me to get the tracks. We just turned them all in at the end of the festival. So I, I was able to spend, you know, maybe an hour or two after the festival was over, just listening through and making some small adjustments. It's, back back you know, in your studio, I think it was. Right, right yeah, I, I did go back to my studio, which, you know, still probably not perfect. It, you know, it wouldn't, it's still probably not going to be quite like if I spent two days mastering something, but, but you know, maybe got us a little bit closer, I think. I don't yeah, know, sure. maybe I did bad things. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember, honestly. I was so fried. At the, it was a lot of hard just, work, wasn't it? It was just... I don't know. It's, uh, it's well, exhausting. I think that I, the pilgrimage festival this year, the pilgrimage sessions was our first year doing it. So it yeah. was compared to doing a Bonnaroo session, it was actually quite a light load in the studio. And mm-hmm. I think we maybe did, uh, was it, it was over 30 songs or something, right? 35. 35. Yeah. How's that maybe? sound everybody? 35 songs recorded, mixed and mastered in a weekend. And that was a light load for us. But anyway, I'm not trying to brag here or anything. No, but, Bonnaroo is like a hundred usually. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Um, and it's very intense. And, you know, when we do the Bonner thing, it's what, like 10 days of nonstop hard work, Ooh. setting up the studio, taking it down, everything. It's crazy. It, anyway. It's stressful, but it's super rewarding. I will yeah. say that. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Hey, everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks 
and you get downloadable multi-tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi-track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com Enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. All right, well, let's jump into the final part of the show here. Let's jump into the jam session. I'll do a series of questions and just kind of, uh, these are things that probably are full of exciting and cool tips and tools for people to use, and then also like things that help inspire people a little bit. Um, let me start at the beginning. Joe, tell me what was holding you back at first from getting started and recording? What was a, what was a big obstacle for you getting going? Uh, kind of a lack, mostly a lack of knowledge. I just didn't know what I was doing or know anything about it. Wait, are you saying you didn't have a podcast like recording studio rock stars to listen to and learn <laughs> That's from? That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, just kind of a, a lack of, of having any knowledge whatsoever. Also, I, I guess a lack of just anything to record with, you know, other than uh, like your built-in laptop speaker or something. I didn't, it was un- until I started to really get interest, interested and, and kind of changed my focus over from music to recording while I was at Belmont Nashville that I bought a little mobile inbox rig with a mic and then started actually seeing what it was like to record things. So I guess not having gear at least a basic setup can get in the way, but mostly it was just, I didn't know what I was doing. So what was a first rig? What did that look like for you? It was a <laughs> mobile know. inbox, which is one so, of the Pro Tools, so dumb. You know, yeah. USB I, connectors and two I just inputs, bought a right? little, yeah, a little inbox interface and like a, I think a, a 57 was my first mic. And Dude, a that's sure a good SM57. choice. A sure and SM57. You know, because it sounded cool if I used it to record guitar and it sounded fine if I used it to record vocals and, and, uh, I don't know. It, it, it worked. Now, what about the computer itself? I just had a little Apple MacBook that was running Pro Tools so on So a laptop it. was able mm-hmm. to do it at yeah. that point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. I still use a laptop for Well, for yeah, recording. now. I mean, I can <laughs> imagine. I'm just mean like early on, laptops were, they were pretty clunky beasts. This was know? like gen- generation one MacBook Pro, I think. Yeah. Like wow. when they first came out. They were, it was $3,000 for a really slow, but at the time, super fast laptop. Okay. So tell us what was one, uh, some of the best advice that you might've received when you were starting out or along the way anywhere? Uh, <clears throat> probably as, as an audio engineer, just to, to listen, I think is the best advice I've ever been given. I know that sounds simple, but, uh, you, you can get caught up in wanting to use cool gear or, you know, looking at your you know, RTA plugin that shows you what's going on or, or, you know, watching the meters and trying to achieve a certain amount of loudness or, you know, whatever, in whatever field, just listening is more important. <laughs> just, you know, a lot of people make blind EQ and compression adjustments before they even listen. They're like, I always know that I'm going to EQ my kick drum this way or whatever. It's like, and you know, to a degree that stuff is generally going to work, but listening is just the most important thing you can do. You think that might be the most valuable judgment call of whether something's good or not? <laughs> Listening <laughs> is to it, it possible that if it sounds good or bad, that that's actually what matters? I think that is entirely <laughs> what matters. The only thing that matters. So I remember hearing stories about Led Zeppelin in the studio, and and I apologize for not being able to name drop producers and engineers on this, but I don't know who it was. But the story that I heard when I started out was that when Zeppelin was in the the studio, the producer would take tape and tape over the meters don't look at the meters, like forget those meters on the tape machine in the console. So, I mean, like if you're not don't have meters to look at, what else is there? Yeah. You just listen. You just listen <laughs> yes. and see if it sounds good. <laughs> that's you know? it. So that's great. I think that's a great, uh, great advice. Let's not forget that. And hopefully you're listening to this podcast right now. Yes. Thank you. All right, cool. So <laughs> next one, man, share with us a recording tip, hack or secret sauce, Ooh. something that our listeners could use right now. 
it's, I don't it, know. it sounds fancier than it is, just like anything you can think of that would be cool to. Uh, I'm sure a lot of a lot of people out there are familiar with the idea of uh, parallel compression or parallel uh, harmonic exciting, that kind of thing, where you just you know you just blend in a tiny bit of of like a squashed version of what's going on, and you know to where it doesn't really affect the way that your your primary mix or master sounds, but it it sort of gives it this extra little like woo. You know, so what do you mean by squash? There's going to be people listening who okay. don't know what a squash version uh, is. So, so what's that? you know, the idea of, of like a parallel compression, for instance, is you, uh, you've got your set of tracks and uh, you compress them in whatever way you want and you can you can just crank it up, just absolutely destroy it to where it kind of sounds terrible or cool, depending on what you want. And, you know, just, I mean, just absolutely squashing it with compressor. You t- you right, turn you're you the- making it sound in a way that you wouldn't say, oh, that's finished. That's not the sound I'm going to use. I no, wouldn't, it's I wouldn't just, use it's just like kind of, a, kind of a crazy different sound. So then you take that and a lot of compressors nowadays actually have a mix knob where you, and you would just, you just dial the mix back really low to where it's just blending in the slightest bit of that really different com- overly compressed sound but your primary sound is still the primary sound you've just got a little bit of a little bit of oomph from that you know just blend it in 15 percent or 10 percent or something you know i don't know that that's that when i discovered parallel compression was a thing years ago it's just been my favorite thing <laughs> ever since. <laughs> compression is so awesome i yeah. love it well so now uh, just to reiterate that again you have a choice. Let's say you're mastering. You've got a choice to take your track and run it through a compressor, mm-hmm. which, which but you, you do. don't have to. Is the yeah. point? Mm-hmm. Parallel compression is saying, "Hey, let's not run the track through a compressor. Let's make a copy of the track over here and squash the snot or compress compress it like crazy, and then just blend that little super compressed version in at a low level with the uncompressed one. And when you mix those back together, that's parallel compression, yep. right? Yeah, yep. cool." All right. So um, next up, uh, how about you? You talked about doing a lot of study and research to learn mastering. Can you share with our listeners um, any favorite books or films that that you might want to recommend? Probably my favorite engineer related film that I can think of, probably because it's one of the only ones I can think of. It's not necessarily mastering related, uh, but it, it, it was about a guy named Tom Dowd. Uh, yeah, that's great. Tom Dowd and the Language of Music, I think is what it's called. And it's he was a uh, uh, an engineer who sort of helped pioneer multi track recording, and he also was a part of the Manhattan Project. <laughs> That's <laughs> he's, right. He's a very that. very brilliant guy. Um, but uh, yeah, watching that and hearing about his life was was really inspiring, just as an engineer uh, and as a as a music lover. Yeah. Um, so specific to mastering, I don't know, but I I did love that documentary and recommend it highly. Yeah, so I'm not remembering the title of the documentary off the top of my head, but we will have it in the show notes. So listeners, yeah. just go check out the show notes to get that. What about resources, books that you remember, uh, anything that would be a great place to start to learn mastering, for example? There's a book called uh, Mastering Audio, The Art and the Science by Bob Katz okay. that I read and I recommend it. It was, it was a very uh, eye-opening thing to read. I read it early on and sort of got a... From there, got a better understanding of of sort of what it was. And, well, one and what could it almost say it was ear opening. Uh, yeah, your ear opening. <laughs> nice. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. Cool. Great. Great tips. Now, how about um, just off the top of your head? How about sharing a favorite hardware tool for the studio? Could be anything from like a tuner, or mic, some favorite piece of gear, some uh, physical tool in the mm, studio. One of my one of my favorites is uh, Stereo GML EQ. It's the uh, oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking With about? The colorful knobs. The colorful knobs. Yeah. And I don't even know the model number of it, but I do love it. Thank you, George Massenberg. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a mastering tool for sure. We it, will share that in the show notes as well. Yeah. And I mean, there, there are a lot of them. Pendulum Audio makes a lot of good, good, uh, they make a very mu kind of thing. Yeah. And they make a, a peak limiter that I use a lot. Uh, a lot of good things out there. I just use an SPL mastering limiter that just came out. Okay. Uh, mastering compressor, sorry. Uh, I've just tried it out. I don't actually own it. It was very cool. Sorry, you only asked me for one thing. Well, so no, no, I'm going to cheat a little bit and ask you, how about your headphones? Like what are, what, if you're going to master in headphones, mm. you recommend anything? Uh, yeah, I have, I have several pairs of headphones. Uh, I really like uh, Focal just put out, the uh, French company just put out uh, some headphones maybe just over a year ago, a year and a half ago or something. 
uh, the, I think they're the spirit professionals or something, whatever the high end version of the headphones that they put out. And, uh, I love them. They're not particularly fun to listen to in that they're, they're pretty bright and it's, and maybe even a little harsh, uh, but they're very, you know, very true to what's happening and unforgiving, which is why I like using them in, in a mastering setting and make, making sure you don't screw up. So what would be an example? You're in a pair of Focals listening and something sounds a little harsh or something sounds like the, is the high end too much and that that's cluing you into something? How? Well, also, I mean, that's with any set of headphones or any set of monitors, you eventually learn how they sound and how they should sound. And you hear them sounding differently. You hear them sounding n- not pleasantly, you know, and, and, and it's, it's just, I found with those headphones, it's easier for me to tell the small differences, which, you know, like, oh, there's just a little bit too much, like 2.5K going on right here. Just like that, that harshness kind of thing. And I'm able to hear those subtle differences a little more clearly, uh, Actually, it's really easy to hear them in headphones versus versus uh, on speakers. A lot of times, you can really dial into those, especially what's going on on the sides. Well, I'm gonna um, maybe you can comment on this too. But one of the big differences between making some decisions like that in headphones versus speakers is speakers are coupled with the sonics of the room, and so they're the room is affecting the way the speaker sounds. But you know, coming through the air, to, the air to your ear. <laughs> it's another hard couple of words. And uh, headphones don't have that because the headphone is right there. The room doesn't affect and you can, your headphones will sound the same to you no matter where you listen to them. Maybe if you listen on the moon, it would be different because <laughs> there's no atmosphere, <laughs> but you know. But yeah, no, you're right. It, it, so it, it's a really good reference to, to check things on headphones, um, I find anyway. Because uh, really, ultimately, not trying to go off on a tangent here, this, is, this will be short. Really, ultimately, what you're going for uh, in a mastering scenario is you want to listen to the most flat, true sounding thing possible. Like you, you just want to know what's there. You don't want any sort of hyped high end. You don't want to listen to anything that's, that's very adjusted or sounds different. You just want, you just want a really flat, true listening environment. And if you, if you have that and you make decisions based on that, yes, people are going to be listening on, on different sort, you know, Apple earbuds, you know, you might have like the Beats by Dre with tons of bass. You might be listening just off of your iPhone speaker. And those are all different. But when you take the average of all those things, it, it kind of ends up being flat. I mean, that that's something I've I've learned and heard over the years is it's, you know, you, you don't try to mix for specific platforms. You just make it sound good in a, in a true platform and, and it'll and that'll sound the best over the most platforms, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. It's like uh, when you're mastering, also, I imagine you don't really want the headphones or the speakers to start making your stuff sound exciting for you. No, no, no. That would be your job. Oh, yes. So if you want it to be more exciting sounding, it lets you know that it's up to you to do that. I'm guessing, right? Correct. I'm putting words in your mouth. Stop me if I'm wrong. No, no. And you're totally right. And I'm not going to like bash any particular brands of anything. Just that there are some sets of monitors. What about McDonald's? Can we bash McDonald's? McDonald's is not involved, but <laughs> if you want. <laughs> what um, if they become a, a future sponsor on the podcast? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So, um, all right, let's 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 go to one last one here. You are, uh, as so many people are, an independent businessman. You're, you're self-employed doing this in music. Um, can you share with our listeners a great resource for the business side of recording? Uh, sure. Can I, can it be a person? Yeah, it can be, it can be definitely be a person. So my, my, uh, my accountant <laughs> is, uh, a guy named Gene Riley, Gene Riley of Zeal Financial Services, as I believe it was called. He's located here in town in, in Brentwood, Tennessee. And I think he's in Brentwood. Um, anyway, he's fantastic. He saved me so much trouble in my first few years of being self-employed and helps me every year. And I cannot... Someone who can give you advice, it's because it's complicated being, you know, Yeah. It, it's not, it's not simple. It's not, you don't just get pay, paychecks where they take taxes out and it's easy for you to have health insurance. Like you got to deal with all these things. You got to deal with complicated write-offs and mileage and it just, that's been invaluable having someone who knows all of that and can help me. And yeah, Gene Riley, fantastic. Okay, cool. We'll, we will definitely share a link in the show notes to Gene if he's taken on clients from Anywhere and everywhere. Then, oh, I'm sure uh, he is. Then that'll be great. We'll, we'll let people find him if they want to. So that's awesome. All right, so um, here we go. We're coming up on the last question here, or maybe two. 
but uh, this this one's kind of the doozy. We get all metaphysical with it. So, um, Joe, let's let's say hypothetically you were dropped into a strange city and you could only take a simple setup for recording. What would you choose? Or let's instead of recording, we'll say mastering in this case. What oh. would you choose? How would you find people to master? And more importantly, if you're starting out, how are you going to make ends meet so that you can survive and keep doing this thing and, mm. and really build up your mastering ability? That is, uh, it's difficult. I don't know. Um, yes, you do. You did it. Yeah, <laughs> I would, I'd probably have a really simple, basic rig, like a laptop and, you know, a small set of, of monitors and some headphones and, and a decent portable converter, like a Apogee Duet or something. Those sound pretty good. Well, let's get specific. So you just went to pilgrimage and you look like you had a pretty portable setup to me. Can you, oh, can yeah, you sure. tell us what you used for that? So yeah, I, I do have a portable, a rig, uh, I have a home studio, um, I typically master at a, at, a, at another studio that's owned by someone else, but my at my home studio where I'll often do edits to masters and, and little things, <clears throat> I'm using a Universal Audio Apollo, and I'm clocking it off of a, oh no, I've forgotten the name of my clock. So, I have, I have, so the Universal <laughs> Audio have, Apollo is the interface. Yeah, is, is, is the interface. Is that like a FireWire or a Thunderbolt? It's a Thunderbolt like? interface. And that, um, that hooks up straight to your laptop, which is what? It's a uh, just... MacBook Pro from like a couple years ago. Okay. It's a uh, Antelope. That's that's my clock. Oh, the Antelope an ant- clock. I have yeah. an Antelope clock, which uh, you know, for years I was not a believer, but uh, after hearing it with and without, it uh, it makes my Apollo sound significantly better. Um, so yeah, I use that, um, and then I'm mostly using. If if I'm home, I'm entirely using software. There's no hardware involved at all, right. um, and. I <clears throat> I use a program called Studio One uh, primarily just for sequencing. I don't really do much in it other than sequence, and it and it it's an easy way to give people different file types that they want: uh, DDPs, disk images, um, files for digital releases, etc. And you can add metadata easily to files. Um, and that's the that's the app made by PreSonus. Yes, uh, and there, there's they have kind of like a project overview which you can use for mastering. Probably not a lot of people use it, but it just, it works for me. So, um, and then I, I use a number of, of plugins, uh, and I'm a couple of universal audio plugins and, uh, probably the primary one is, is not universal audio is, uh, isotope ozone uh-huh. is probably the most useful thing in the world it's to like me. It's all in one. Oh, it's amazing. Knife, it's, yeah. and it's such, it's very well made isotope. They know what they're doing. So you said you were assembling in Studio One. Are you using something else to actually change the sound with the plugins in? Uh, no, I mean I'm I'm just using I'm I'm using like Ozone or or some UAD plugins or whatever to to change the sound. I I just mean that in in Studio One. Yes, in okay, Studio I'm sorry. One. I'm I not, thought you meant you were using different DAWs. No, I I mean I my I was just saying that because I I don't think it matters all that much. People would argue with me, but if you have something that can lay your songs out in sequence and you can add metadata to it. I don't know why it matters what you use. Okay, cool. So you mean you're, you're implying that uh, somebody doesn't have to have Studio One, but uh, that they right. could probably start with whatever. And likewise, someone really doesn't have to have Wave Labs or what, or, you know, yeah. programs that most, most people would use. All right, cool, man. Right on. All right, so um, then next question was, uh, how do you find people to, to record or master? Mm, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I would probably, and this is just me being, being practical, uh, I would probably just go get a part-time job somewhere to try to meet people. <laughs> that might sound dumb, yeah. <laughs> but, no, but I think like, and real. you know, to try to build up, I mean, if I was in a totally new city to try to build up some connections, um, most of the connections I have now, I made going to school in Nashville for four years and working, I, I did work a, a part-time job, worked at the Apple store here in Nashville. And so through going to Belmont and working at the Apple store, I just made a ton of connections and I interned for a few people and met some people that way. Um, and that's, you know, all of my work just comes from connections that I made pretty much. Now I'm starting to get some distant online people, but for the first, you know, five years that I've been doing this, it's all just been word of mouth friends saying like, Hey, yeah, I know a guy who masters you should, you know, it's like, you just have this, <clears throat> I mean, networking and knowing people is just so important. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, so if I were in a, in a strange city, I would probably just go get a job to try to meet some people and then, and then let them know what I do and, and, you know, just work really hard to get involved with a project. Mm-hmm. 
and, you know, hope that something took off from there. Yeah. Maybe even, uh, would you suggest that, so, that it makes sense to find opportunities to do something for free at first at the very beginning? Oh or? yeah, definitely. If no one knows who you are, you know, you, all you, all you can do is impress them. It's, it's sometimes it's hard to get people to pay you, um, if they don't know anything, you know, I, I have no delusions. I'm not a big name mastering engineer. Um, which, which is why in, in the, for, for just for religious he podcast, said again, but <laughs> just, yeah, he records hundreds of songs at Bonnaroo. Yeah. Else. Well, no, anyway, anyway, you're I, a humble dude, man. You're a humble dude, Joe. But that, that's why, you know, in, in situations like this, I'd, you know, anyone who's interested, I'd love to do a test master for you. Just, uh, you know, I'm not Bob Ludwig, but nice, I'd, I'd like to prove my worth. Nice. Um, you mean you won't just, they won't send you their file <laughs> and then you just listen to it once and send it back to them without making a change and go, okay, that'll be. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey man, he, he can do it. I'd trust him. Right on, man. Right on. Um, okay, cool. So uh, last, uh, our closing question here, what is the single most important thing a listener can do to become a rock star of the recording studio? Mm, probably just working, <laughs> just trying, just working. improving, yeah. Uh, yeah. just doing it. Yeah. I mean- I, I, I went to school for audio engineering, but I feel like most of what I've learned was by doing it and by making mistakes and by periodically doing things right, just yeah. by doing it. So just um, do it kind of thing. Just do it, yeah. I, it, it, it helps a lot to learn from someone who knows what they're doing. Go out and get an internship from someone Can like Shaw. Can you imagine if somebody, <laughs> wouldn't that be awesome though if somebody had a resource like a free podcast where they could listen yeah, to interviews wow. with people like yourself and learn all kinds of stuff. <laughs> all right, cool, man. Awesome, dude. Goofing around. And thank you so much for being here on Recording Studio Yeah, Rockstars. thanks for having me. Totally fun hanging out with you. Sorry, it took us a moment to get going at the start. No but problem. can you let our listeners also know how they can uh, find you and, and learn more about you and, and follow up with you? Yes. So my website is garagemasters.net. Garage is in where you park your car. Garagemasters.net. Uh, and my email is garagemasters at iCloud.com. Okay, cool. Right on, man. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here with us, Joe. Great. Thanks for having me. I look forward to seeing you around the neighborhood. Yeah. Cheers, dude. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.